Okay, good morning everyone. Are you having a good time here so far? Excellent. Sorry we had some technical difficulties just there, but fingers crossed it will be fine now. Um, so I'm Martin from Jess. I'm going to talk about robots and AI and, and stuff like that. We're also going to try and record this session. So we have some sessions where we're live streaming and a few that we're recording a bit more ad hoc way. So if you wonder what that phone is doing on the tripod there, it's going to try and record this and see if we can stick it up on YouTube later on. But, of course, that only records me doing my bit. So what I wanted to do is to just get a little 360 selfie of the whole group. So I'm going to, I'm going to count you down, three, two, one, and then I'd like you to kind of raise your arms in the air and go, woo, if you're up for it, you don't have to. And then I'll, I'll probably tweet that later on. So, you ready for this? Three, two, one, and have a woo! <laughs> and I'll do a second one for good pressure. So, hopefully that's, that's warmed you up, remembering up. I'm going to talk about three things today, and if you're uh, a David Bowie fan, you might recognise that two of, two of these things are the names of David Bowie songs. I actually thought, that's why I that's why own um, rather poor tribute to David Bowie. I actually thought that David Bowie must have written a song about robots. And so um, the other day, I thought, well, you know, I've got a half an hour, I'm not doing anything. I'll just, I'll just go through and see if I can find a good David Bowie song type about robots. And do you know what? Never. David Bowie never wrote a song with robot in the title. What a missed opportunity. Disappointed. So we, we have to make up for that now today. Um, as part of my, my warm-up, I wondered if anybody had ever seen this letter. So this is a letter from someone called Ray, and this is written in 1953. Has anybody seen the letter from Ray? No, so by the looks, would anybody like to hazard a guess who, who Ray might be? Who do you think Ray might be? Ray Bradbury? Anyone else? So he's a writer, more commonly known as Raymond. Raymond Chandler, yeah, so this is actually the first time that the word Google appeared in print. So of all things, it was Raymond Chandler writing a letter to one of his friends saying, do you know what, sign switching? It's easy, anyone could do it. I mean, the blah, the blah, the blah, the blah, uh, you know, my breath froze into pink pretzels, and etc, etc, at Google. Isn't that amazing? So I, I don't know the answer to this, but I, I like to picture that when Larry and Sergi were, you know, in starting Google up in, in the garage over in California, they were sitting there going, oh, we've got to give this thing a name, and then they just chanced upon this. I hope that while you're here today and tomorrow, you'll chance upon a few interesting things like this. For me, this was absolutely fascinating. But where are we now? Um, one of the things that you'll see quite a lot of around the place is robots. I just wanted to make it clear, I am not a robot. Ooh, I'd like, that is supposed to be a video. Let's see if it plays. I am not a robot. But there are a lot of robots around. Did you see what the robot did? With that great rap soundtrack? So, the robot actually filled out, you know those little capture boxes? So the robot, a real robot with a pen. The box that says, I am not a robot. Isn't that brilliant? Isn't that brilliant? But, robots and the internet things are becoming increasingly a part of our lives. So, the robots that you see here today, probably you won't see in your high street just yet. You know, Pepper the, the robot is working as a greeter in some stores, we'll talk about that in a minute. Maybe you won't see Pepper in your high street just yet. Maybe you'll see Pepper in six months. Maybe you'll see Pepper in a year. But really, what is this all about? And it's about, in my impression, it's about particularly venture capitalists saying, can we put a chip in this? Can we put a chip in this piece of, um, you know, Hardware, but maybe a toothbrush. We'll put a chip in a toothbrush. Let's see what happens. We don't know if it will work. We don't know if people will want to buy a toothbrush 
with the chip connected, connected to the internet. But heck, let's give it a try. So this particular one, this is a product that um, Philips have produced, uh, which is a smart toothbrush. And the smart toothbrush tries to tell you about how good your technique is. So you know you always miss that bit around the back. And actually, this at one level this sounds quite facile, but yeah, right, smart toothbrush. And another level entirely, you think, well, actually, I, I went to the dentist the other week, and the dentist said, you know, there's this bit around here, you just, you're not reaching it, and the plaque's starting to build up, and you might have to do something about that. And you start to well, actually, that smart toothbrush, it might seem like a gimmick, and it might seem quite expensive, but, you know, I had to have a crown done not long ago, and that, that was pretty expensive. That on its own would be a smart toothbrush. So that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, not so sure about the happy fork. Has anyone seen one of these in real life? So this is, this is the fork that tries to um, gather information about your eating habits. So you pick the food up, you have to use the fork, obviously, so you know it's not good for soup and things like that. But you have to use the fork and then it knows that you put the fork in your mouth and it has some idea about your chewing behavior. So is, this, is the happy fork going to take off? The proposition maybe is not quite as strong as taking care of your teeth. But, you know, what actually do you put in your body every day? Maybe the fork, it's pretty dumb right now, maybe the fork could hobble a little bit and do some other stuff. One of the things you'll see in the Digi Lab is a thing called the SIO, which is a, a pocket size spectrometer. And that can actually analyze uh, the content of food, it can tell you whether food is fresh and whether food has gone off, it can tell you how much fat is in the food, and things like that. Do go and have a look at it. You can, you can take your body fat with, with the SIO uh, pocket spectrometer, and that's, that's quite illuminating. Maybe the happy fork will reach that point. Maybe it's going to be a year, maybe it's going to be two years. You pick the fork up and quickly scans your food and says, Ooh, Hold on a minute. <laughs> There's bacteria there, um, you know, that, that chicken hasn't been fully cooked. Watch out. Um, but as I say, the, the thing here is that what we're seeing right now is people who have a lot of money throwing money at just about anything that you can put a chip in. And I have seen smart chairs, for instance. I'm afraid the chairs here today aren't smart, so the chairs don't know if you're fidgeting. The chairs don't know if you get up, sit there, and you know, pop out for five minutes. But um, some of our um, friends of City of Liverpool College actually did have that. They have smart chairs that they've built that can tell how many seats in the class are occupied, how many people are fidgeting, and this kind of thing. Very interesting bit of work they've done with Microsoft. But well, what happens when these devices get owned? What happens when they get exploited? Because the internet is designed by people with the best intentions, but often the world has people who are not perhaps so well inclined. And that's where um, I call the Internet of Porn and Things comes in. And porning is a, might, might sound like something else, but that's actually a term that the hacker community use for um, devices that have been exploited and taken over. And this is the map. This is the map of, of porn and things. Um, this is a site called Showdown. We can go to showdown.io and it is. And you can see um, buses, trains, power stations, all kinds of things that people should never have connected to the internet. So, you know, we're talking about forks and toothbrushes. You might find your light bulb somewhere. You know, this is a real possibility. So, Showdown is very interesting, but it's also very alarming. You look at it and you think, oh my gosh, <laughs> why are these people connecting these things to the internet? Probably the most famous example of that is the CCTV cameras. Um, all over the world that have um, insecure settings and they have things like default passwords. You don't need to be a master hacker to exploit the CCTV if the username is administrator and the password is administrator. And there are a lot of examples of this admin and the password is password and things like this. You, you don't have to be a, a master criminal to figure out how to do this. And those CCTV cameras all over the world recently were co-opted to form a botnet to do attacks on all sorts of major internet services and that sorts. So we go from putting a chip into everything to really some, some quite um, far-reaching and in many cases quite undesirable consequences. But that's not about AI and robotics and education. So I have to sort of bring you, bring you back down to earth for a minute here. 
Um, I'm not really going to talk about that except um, sort of in casting. What I'm going to talk about is those wider societal implications. I'm going to ask you to have a think about what they might mean for education, for teaching and learning. I've got a couple of examples to, to warm you up with this. So um, we, we got Amazon Alexa, the, the Echo device last year, like I'm, I'm sure many of you did. But it's quite interesting to see what you can ask Alexa. So you can say to Alexa things like, well, you know, what, what is the phase of the moon? That's quite relevant to me because my daughter came home from school with a sheet the other week. And she said, my project, my homework project for this month is to record the phases of the moon. And I have to go outside and I have to go and look up at the moon. And actually, do you know what? It was the cloudiest month I think we've ever had. So we knew there was a moon up there somewhere. And we could use the Google Sky map app to figure out the moon was kind of up that way, but we couldn't actually see it. We couldn't even see much more than a sort of vague glow through the clouds. We can ask Alexa. So, Alexa, what phase of the moon is it? Oh, well, it's waning gibbous. Well, like that. Um, what does that look like? Oh, it's very well. And you sort of think, actually, perhaps we're already using tools like Alexa That's a little bit more than we realise. Um, and, you know, Alexa isn't the only show in town. There's Siri, there's Google Assistant, which debuted uh, on one particular phone, and then uh, has now has a hardware instantiation like um, Amazon Echo. And of course, Siri. So these digital assistants, they're there, they're all around us. They're powered by AI in the same way that, for example, apps like Google Photos are powered by AI. You can go into Google Photos and you can say, find me all the pictures of cats, or find me all the pictures of trees. Find me the pictures of cats up trees. I've not tried yet, I might try that later on. Um, how can we use these things more explicitly in education? Well, Maybe it's the point where, rather than being a passive entity that you would ask questions of, maybe there's a point where the AI starts being a little bit more active. So maybe you, you come down for breakfast and Alexa says, you know, you really need to practice your French. You've got an exam, you've got your GCSEs coming up in a month's time, uh, which I have to know because I see your calendar. Um, just really not happy with your French scores because you've linked the, uh, the VLE into, into the app and you know, it's, it's, it's just not good enough. Let's get practicing. How would you feel about that? How would your children feel about that? It's quite interesting to think about. Um, and at that, that point, you know, when you start to connect things together, of course it, it has all sorts of ramifications because where is that information going? Many people would say, you know, that a little bit suspicious about Google because they perceive that Google are going to sell all their personal information to, to the whole world. Actually, what they do is they sell a, a profile for advertising. So people can say, well, I want to target uh, teenagers. I want to target, uh, you know, the 40 somethings who might want to buy a new car. So they don't really sell your personal information, but the idea has taken hold. And then there's the question about how this relates to. Uh, formal education. So if you go to a school, a college, a university, um, it's not a point where the AI that sits in that playing system it's, uh, starts to feed back a little and starts to say, well, I'm a little bit worried, you know, I've seen, I've seen multiple works. Is he even still a student? Is he still coming here? Um, and that isn't necessarily something that results in a, a human being, uh, I'm sorry, results in an IT system or something. That's probably something that results in a human being picking up the phone, popping around, just to check that you're really okay. And I think for me that's the bigger, bigger message in all of this, is that you can go so far with robots, you can go so far with AI, you can go so far with automation, and actually if we lose the human element, then probably the whole thing doesn't really hold together. So I was talking about Alexa, and over, over Christmas, my daughter and I actually did this as a little bit of a fun project. We thought, what, what could we do with Alexa? Let's, let's figure out how we can program Alexa. So I'm going to get my voice to rest for a minute. I'm going to play a little video which we made. And what we did for this was we, we said, um, let's imagine that Alexa has a JISC skill. Because that's where I'm coming from. You might imagine it has a, your university skill or your college. 
what would you ask your university? So we've got a thing here where we, we um, gave Alexa the ability to answer some questions about just stuff. And if the video plays, you can see what it came up with. Hi, it's Holly here, and I've got my assistant Martin from Jess. I'm also going to take a Not picture. Not long ago, it would have felt a bit weird having conversations with computers. <laughs> We're starting to get used to talking to digital assistants like Amber and Alexa. Alexa, how are you today? Great, thank you. I hope you're doing well too. Now, as you can see, it took me a few trying to get that right. It does happen that. You get used to it after a while. Let's try another one. Alexa, will I need an umbrella in London tomorrow? No rain is expected in London tomorrow. And also, as you saw there, it's very useful for general knowledge around the world. You can use it for weather and music. But what could we do next? Just... People already ask us lots of questions every day. You might not think of them as questions because they arrive by apps, by websites, and by phone, and by email. I'm really interested in how people will extend tools like Alexa to make them do new and innovative things. What would those questions look like if we were asking Alexa? Well, they would be asking Alexa. Ask GIST for open access policy for nature. Journal, nature. This is a Romeo Yellow Journal. Author can archive libraries. Author can archive text trends. Six months from Bargo. Author can archive publisher version slash PDF. Yes. 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 <laughs> Alexa, ask just to search equipment for hyperbaric. Sorry, my voice Equipment for digital then one result. Result one. Pressure. <laughs> <laughs> University of Southampton. Alexa, ask Janet Network status. <laughs> Janet Network status is Wednesday, January 4, 2017. Oh, look at the magic touch. 1,420 connections up. Five connections down. Here are the details of connections that are down or degraded. We are now in the University of London, Y Channel, YPG. Alexa, stop. So if you use services like Janet and Edgewine, leave a comment. Let us know if you would like to ask us. Alexa, have a nice day. Thanks. You too. Bye, everyone. <laughs> So, isn't that fascinating? You know, it, it's like Alexa really knew what we were talking about, but shall I let you into Alexa's dirty little secret? Alexa doesn't really know what you're talking about. When you set up an Alexa skill, you have to tell it what words and phrases to look out for. If you just threw any old question at it, it would have no idea what to do. So when we created that just skill, and you'll see this also with Pepper. If you ask the guy who's, who's operating Pepper, he'll show you the, the scripts that Pepper uses. So we told Alexa, if someone asks for Janet Network status, that means you go up and do this stuff. It doesn't have the ability to understand, if you ask that question, it may be phrased in a slightly different way than what they're talking about. You have to tell it all of the different phrasings that you're expecting. One of the other examples there, we, we searched for the open access policy in the journal of nature. It needs to know the names of all of those journals. So I did a real-time um, lookup in the, in the Sherpa services to find out that open access policy. It needs to know... That's an interesting noise. Uh, I've I think this is quite fascinating. This is Pepper with a stethoscope. 
Uh, think about that. And also, think about what I just told you about how the likes of those. You come along, perhaps, perhaps you know you'll go to A and E or you'll go to your local uh, walk-in centre, and people will line up and say, "How are you feeling?" And they might say, "I think I hurt my leg." Pepper puts hand in your leg, takes a picture of it. How much does Pepper really know? How much could Pepper really infer? Imagine if Pepper is the, the triage nurse in your local uh, A&E department. What could Pepper really do? And we're, we're just starting to understand the answer to that question. What we do know is that Pepper's quite good at being cute. So Pepper is being cute right now in over uh, 10,000 um, places, over 10,000 Pepper units being sold already. Pepper is um, a greeter in a, over 140 mobile phone stores in Japan. Pepper was bought by the Japanese mobile phone. So Pepper actually is already out there, and it, Pepper is starting to fly on its way into all sorts of places. And Nestle, you can see the fancy uh, coffee pot Nestle are planning to introduce uh, Pepper in their Nespresso outlets when you go to buy the fancy coffee pots. So it might not be too long. You know I said six months, a year, no. It might not be too long before you go into a shop and Pepper just lights up and says, hi. Maybe if you're a customer, if you have a loyalty card, if you have an online group, maybe Pepper will say, hi. Hi Martin, what are you doing? You look a bit sad today. It's actually Pepper's big thing is recognizing emotions. Pepper isn't just about being a robot. Pepper is about recognizing emotions and how you feel. And I can tell you you're frowning. What is that? So this is this is quite fascinating. It's a place we've never really been. I'm going to play a competing video to see if we can we can drown out the other side. Let's give this a go. So this is when Pepper visited the Financial Times. No push. Take your time to close the curtains and remove any obstacles that are Say, okay, when you think it's good. Okay. So, I am the robot. You are the human. Thank you. And this is the beginning of a beautiful story. I like humans. Humans are so cute. <laughs> Once existed, only so we'll leave it there, otherwise I, I could play you so many of these videos. Isn't that wonderful? You know, that's the out-of-the-box experience when you get Pepper. Humans are so cute. I could keep one as a pet. Pepper is, Pepper is cute and lovable because Pepper is small. Imagine if Pepper was taller than you. Imagine if Pepper, you know, looked a little bit meaner. Imagine if Pepper looked perhaps a little bit um, less cute. So. All these things are, are possible. And I'll give you one example. It's not a mean robot at all. It's another helpful robot. Um, does anybody know these Danbo things? They're, they're very big in Japan. This is like little uh, robot toys made out of what appear to be Amazon boxes. So if you, if you Google Danbo, D-A-N-B-O, there's a whole subculture of stuff around them, which is just amazing. You see these little robots looking a bit kind of contemplative, looking a bit lost and thoughtful in all sorts of houses and all sorts of places. But actually the Amazon connection is a very, very meaningful one because Amazon have, have deployed um, robotic automation to a, a fantastic extent already. So you know you probably have that idea that um, if it all goes belly up, you know, maybe I could get a Maybe I could get a job as a barista, or you know, maybe I could work in a, in a warehouse if the thing I'm doing right now doesn't work out. Maybe I can do something that's, you know, maybe unskilled labor or semi-skilled. Well, actually, it turns out that um, maybe, maybe the robots don't know what they're doing. So this is uh, an Amazon warehouse, an Amazon distribution site. This is you. You've clicked buy and your online purchase is complete. But Betty Bot's work is just beginning. She's a Kiva robot at Quiet Logistics Fulfillment Center. I'm not sure why Betty needs to be called Betty. Behind every online store is a warehouse a full of merchandise. Sus. 
One is quiet logistics, where there are one and a half million items stored. It's Fettybot's job to retrieve your purchase, and she can do this faster and more accurately than any human ever could. When you buy something online, your order enters the Kiva database. The software locates the robot closest to your item and directs her to retrieve it. Using a network of barcodes on the floor, she navigates the 300,000 square foot warehouse, tunneling beneath the pods as she moves throughout the grid. When Bettybot reaches her target, she slides beneath the pod and lifts it off the floor. She carries your purchase through the warehouse streets. This area is called the Human Exclusion Zone, where no human may enter. There are 100 Kiva robots operating autonomously on the floor, and the Quiet Logistics crew boasts some of the fastest robots in the business. So this company, Amazon bought, actually, this company called Kiva Robotics, they developed Betty, I'm not sure if they still call it, her, Betty. Um, Betty brings the shelf, the, the stack of stuff, to the handful of humans that work in the warehouse. So you remember um, a few years ago there were a, a few stories about oh well these internet delivery firms, you know, they, they have vast warehouses and the small armies of people walking back and forth. You might like, walk 30, 40, 50 miles a day tracking back and forth, picking up the stuff to put in the box to send to the human, the customer, well, here's the thing. They already have over 30,000 of these robots in Amazon distribution centers. So uh, this, is, this is not a future. It's a bit like Pepper. This isn't a future. This is right now. And these robots don't do an awful lot. You can't have a conversation with them. They can't tell if you're feeling happy or sad. They're very good at bringing shelving to human beings whilst avoiding other robots. That's kind of their core competency. So this, this is really fascinating when you think about, um, as I say, that whole socio-political thing. What, what will we do? What will we do? What will our children do? If the robots are increasingly taking over jobs that, you know, in many cases, quite a lot of people work in these industries. Um, but it's okay, because we still need human pickers. We still need a human being to get the thing and put it in the box for now. Um, and this, if you Google this Amazon picking challenge, you, this is quite fascinating. So what Amazon have done is they've issued a challenge to uh, computer science and robotics teams at top universities. We need, we need an algorithm, we need the hardware that can pick very fragile things, very heavy things, awkwardly shaped things, with robot arm, pick them up without dropping them or crushing them, etc. Lift them over, put them in the box, so you know that handful of humans that are still needed in the warehouse. Well, if the picking challenge works out, maybe not so many anymore. Maybe just one supervisor, and they, you know, they live in the uh, in the human zone. But the whole of the rest of the warehouse is the human exclusion zone, and that would sound a bit sci-fi. Except remember, thirty thousand robots already. So keep an eye on the Amazon picking challenge. Um, the other thing that we've heard a lot about in the last couple of years is autonomous vehicles. So, who's not seen this picture before? Has anybody not seen this? So, this is Google's um, self driving car, which is a, a prototype. And it looks now like they might never actually make this. There was a time when it seemed to be on the cards that you could pop out and get yourself a Google car. I feel slightly disappointed about that. I really wanted one of these. But it seems like what they've decided to do is to go into partnership with folk who make cars to say, we'll take our technology and we'll put it into your vehicles. Which, I mean, that's, that's okay. I still wanted a Google car. Well, maybe if we start a petition or something, they'll actually, they'll actually build one. Um, but the Google car and that technology is, is not the only show on the road by any means. You see what I did there? And there's one particular company which has actually got quite a lot of this technology out there already, which is Tesla. So you might not realize this. So if you see a Tesla, 
And if you live anywhere near or you stop at a motorway services where there's a supercharger station, you'll often see a few Teslas parked up. What you might not realize is all those cars are trained in the AI algorithm, which is going to make the Teslas completely self driving. So as you drive around, the Tesla is recording the details of your journey. It's recording what you did when this happened, when that happened. I was um, bringing my uh, daughter back from, from an activity yesterday evening when a cat ran out across the road. I had to slam the brakes on. You could write an algorithm for what to do if a cat runs out in front of the car. This actually turns out to be much more efficient to just record what people do and then say when this happens, 75% of people slam the brakes on there, or probably we want to slam the brakes on. And actually, a second cat ran out in front of us moments after the first one did. So you just think it's those repetitive actions that train the machine learning model that Tesla's autopilot system uses. So they've already driven over 140 million miles on autopilot, which is a sort of semi autonomous mode. There are already nearly 100,000 Teslas with this capability on the road. And in fact, they reckon that all the new Teslas that you buy now will be capable of being fully autonomous. So that will be a software upgrade. Literally, you'll wake up one morning and you'll get into your car and it'll say, Oh, I can drive myself. Okay. <laughs> That's going to be an interesting day. Um, and of course, Tesla aren't the only people who've been doing this. So Uber uh, famously poached an entire um, robotics and, and uh, autonomous vehicles team from a leading university. And now Uber and Google's self-driving spin-out are locked into a bitter dispute about the sensor that they use to detect the objects around the car. So if you, if you look at self-driving car spin-out and Uber, they've got this big lawsuit brewing, which would be very interesting to see how that shapes up. But I talked about machine learning a minute ago, I didn't really um, break that out and explain what I meant. So, talking about breakouts, let me show you a, a video. Has anybody seen this video before? Uh, I think probably one or two of you have. Um, this is Google's DeepMind AI. This is uh, DeepMind learning to play breakout. And the idea is that they simply said, this is how to be successful at breakout. And they didn't say, by doing this. They said, by getting a high score, by having a game that lasts for a long time. Just a couple of metrics like that. And, well, how would you do that? Well, the answer is that the machine learning model Powers deep one. So, well, I'm trying to play the game. So I move the pad around, okay. I play the game a few times. I play the game a few hundred times. And after it's played the game a few hundred times, it discovers something that I, I wasted quite a bit of time as a kid playing breaking up. And I never realized that you could do this. And after a few hundred games, uh, DeepMind's AI said, we love it. This strategy seems to work quite well for maximizing my score and the length of the game. Practice. And this is a bit like uh, maybe people know about when DeepMind uh, beat the world champion at uh, Go uh, not, not that long ago. The idea that you can do that, it, it now makes it a solved problem. That, that DeepMind um, AI can now always And it, you'll probably see the same thing with Go. Now, deep mind always go. And that's quite a sobering thought. You know, we're used to a world of human frailties. And, you know, had a bit of a rough night last night. You know, went to the drinks reception, not firing on cylinders today. AI doesn't care. AI you know, always perform at its best. But what does that mean for the self-driving car? Let's have a look at this. So this is this is one of Google's prototypes. For a vehicle to drive itself, it needs future. to know where it is in the world. And it also needs to know what's around it. Based on these factors, it needs to be able to make smart and safe driving decisions in the real world. And once you get in the car, you start to get a real feel for the way the technology works and what it's like in real driving situations. And you'll see what the car So there are a few things that have to happen before the car can safely drive itself. First, it has to figure out its location in the world. So we use GPS, but GPS isn't always that accurate, which is why we rely on our other sensors, like the laser, which picks up on details in the environment that help us identify a more precise location. 
So think of the sensors as the car's eyes and ears, but with eyes that can see far off into the distance and 360 degrees around the car. And the great thing about having all these sensors is that they can talk to each other and get cross-checked information about the environment. So while we take in a ton of information using our sensors, it's our software that really processes all of this and differentiates between objects. All these objects are visible on the laptop that the safety drivers use while testing the vehicles. Based on what the vehicle senses and processes, these objects will be represented by different colored boxes. Cyclists will be red, pedestrians yellow, and the vehicles will appear as either green or pink. These boxes demonstrate the processing that takes place within the software. And think about the complexity here. People look different, cars have different shapes and sizes, yet despite these nuances, the software needs to classify these objects appropriately based on factors like their shape, movement pattern, or location. For example, if there's a cyclist in a bike lane, the vehicle understands that this is a cyclist, not another object like a car or a pedestrian. So the cyclist appears as a red box on the safety driver's so you get the idea, and we could, we could go on again, there are lots and lots of videos that show how this works. That spinning around thing on top of the car is, is called a, a LiDAR unit, and it is literally shooting out thousands of laser beams every second, just checking to see if there's an object in the way. And a slight aside, but UK government has actually mapped the entire country using LiDAR, so you can get an open data set, which is Effectively, from the satellite um, viewpoint, every object in the UK. You can do some brilliant things with that. There's a chap called Chris Gutteridge at Southampton who's got a Minecraft map generator that uses that data. So you punch in your postcode and it will make you a Minecraft map of your home, your town, Birmingham, ICC, and that sort of thing. But the LiDAR in these cars is hugely expensive right now. So what Waymo have done is they've managed to get the cost of that sensor right down. And that's why the dispute with Uber is so um, keenly felt, because they think that's their key piece of intellectual property. But that was the self-driving car. So right now the self-driving car is just sort of creeping onto the road. So those Teslas will get their updates. You know, if you ordered a Tesla Model 3 when they did their big um, PR push, maybe that will come fully self-driving out of the box. It will just roll up to your door and announce itself as I'm here. And, um, you know, that, that could happen very soon. In fact, those cars will be coming out very soon. And there's the catch, because actually lots of people rely on driving cars or trucks for a living. So, for example, in the States, there's about three million people who drive trucks for a living. I didn't show it here, but one of the other self-driving startups is called Otto. And Otto's product is a self-driving truck. So three million people drive trucks for a living in the States alone. And Otto potentially poses an existential threat for a lot of those people. And there, and there, hence, my uh, chap who's actually in San Francisco, so this is uh, apparently a guy in San Francisco who's down and out, but digitally, still digitally connected. And I think what we, what we often fail to think about is how quickly any one of us could be in that position. You fail to make a few mortgage payments, there's a few little problems, maybe your work has a cash flow problem, just can't quite to pay you. You can't keep your payments up, you end up out on the street like him. What will happen to us if these technologies spread and spread and take over and we don't manage to understand that where the human element of them fits in? And the thing that I think is particularly interesting here is that it's not just it's not just confined to one segment. It's not a blue colour thing, it's not a white colour thing. It cuts across the whole space of, of what we do, human enterprise. And does that mean that we'll all end up as, as new Luddites, as I put it here, throwing, throwing stones at the Google bus, which actually happened in San Francisco. So the tech shuttles that take folk who work for firms like Google to and from work, they've, lately they've been starting to be you know, attacked by people literally throwing rocks at them uh, to protest because they feel that they're losing out that these tech companies, these AI products, these robots, all these things we're talking about today are going to, not just put them out of a living, but maybe, you know, put them out of a home as well, meaning there will be no food on the table. This is actually quite a big deal. It's so maybe, I've got living wage here, but we could also say universal basic income. Maybe we're actually moving to a world where in order to quell that unrest, 
people need to have some sort of basic level of income because the society has a huge amount of money turning around with it, but those people don't see most of that money. So that's, that's quite an interesting thing in itself. But what happens if the robot, what happens if the AI puts you out of a job? Right now, a lot of us, what we do, our sense of purpose is defined by our job. And you see this often when people retire. Uh, well, what do I do with myself? Um, I have been a, a truck driver, a taxi driver, and I, I worked as a, as a, a warehouse operative. That's what I do. Um, now I don't have that purpose anymore. So what will replace the sense of purpose that we used to have, and we used to have a job? That, that's another very interesting thing to think about. Um, also, of course, at the same time, we are growing more and more habituated to staring at screens. And you know, but when was the last time you took your phone into the toilet with you? Because I know I shouldn't do this, but you know, how many people do that? Quite a few. Um, that question about what the implications are for us, I think it's really telling that in China, 86% of Chinese kids have to wear glasses. And, you know, is that because there's a culture of in extreme study? Is it because the culture of, of screen time has taken over? And our own children and grandchildren. It would be interesting to think about when you go back home, do you have kids or do you see your grandkids? How much time do they spend looking at a screen every day? And then actually flip that around and ask yourself the same question. How much time do I spend staring at a screen? I'm looking at one right now, of course. Um, so lots, lots of very interesting questions there, but that's a little bit dystopian. And I, I don't want to end on a downbeat note, so I'd like to end on a bit more of an upbeat note. So we think about um, virtual reality, for instance, virtual and augmented reality, or as Microsoft would say, mixed reality, out-of-body experiences. When Google figured out that they could fold up a sheet of cardboard and you could slip a phone into it, virtual reality suddenly became something that you could pick up for five pounds as an impulse buy at your supermarket. And previously, those things you would have had to spend hundreds, maybe thousands of pounds on specialist PC hardware, a special graphics card, special VR headsets. Now, literally, you just get a bit of cardboard, fold it up, stick your phone in it, and you can be visiting the pyramids of Giza, you can take a tour around the International Space Station and look down on Earth, which looks very small and very fragile when you're looking down on it from space. It feels like you're really there. And that's something that we, we couldn't really do before. That, in a, in a, anything other than a few people in labs, in the specialist research centers. The technologies that we've been talking about mean that there will be whole new occupations. So right now there aren't many uh, DNA engineers, for instance, there aren't many asteroid miners. There will be a whole host of new occupations that come out of the technologies we're talking about now. And I had to put the NASA Visit Mars poster up as a case in point. In just a few years' time, we will be sending human beings to Mars. NASA want to do this, SpaceX want to do it. I'm pretty sure Jeff Bezos with his Blue Origin um, company also want to do this. Human beings will exist in places that we've never existed before. Your children or your grandchildren could be asteroid miners. The skills that they need to do that, the um, expertise that they need to do that, these are things that we don't even really understand yet. So we could say, well, let's be you know, pessimistic it's all going to hell. It, it will end very badly. But I think actually we should look at this as an opportunity. Let's say we're building, we're building smart homes now, those internet connected devices. Hopefully they won't get uh, formed by Bulgarian hackers. Actually, to do that right, our smart homes need, uh, I'll put it here rather glibly, smart plumbers, smart electricians. There are so many things that are happening in our lives now that we need to kind of step up our, and let's call it digital skills to take account of. And then the other obvious huge change in recent times has been the way that the nation state has reasserted itself. And I think this is the really fascinating thing 
where this new trend towards um, pride in nationhood, let's call it, maybe nationalism, you might say, um, collides with technology. Because technology doesn't care about national boundaries. Technology will just flow seamlessly across them. We can't really stop it. And people have tried. We've seen the Great Firewall of China, for instance. But what you'll also see if you Google that is a huge number of ways of bypassing it. Well, you can use proxies, you can use VPNs, as this, as this. Any attempt that someone places to, to block things off on the internet generally is circumvented very quickly. These ideas of nationhood and the idea of technology and, and the technology that we talked about today, they fundamentally they're in conflict. And it'll be very interesting to see perhaps new nations will evolve as a result. I got my Estonian e-residency not long ago. That's quite fascinating. I can start a business in the EU trading in euros through my Estonian e-residency. I'm not an Estonian national, but I have that capability. It's a, it's a bit like being Estonian. So I don't know, maybe there's 10% of me as Estonian. How does that work? Our, our brains aren't really wired to understand these concepts. So my, my closing shot for you is this whole thing about portfolio careers, continuous learning, and I think particularly bite-sized learning. Let's say you want to learn about the TensorFlow technology that powers a lot of the Google AI. It's open source. You can download it. You can learn about it from online courses. If you know about coding already, you can add on TensorFlow quite easily. So let's say you major on something. You want to top up your skills. That's just something very specific that you can learn and you can spend a couple of days learning about. I think you'll see an awful lot more of it. And, and that's something that institutions can really embrace and exploit. How does that work in practice? Okay, so, not long ago, Udacity said, oh yeah, we're doing this self-driving car nano degree. Remember the self-driving car? Yeah, okay, how does that work? Oh, well, I'm going to do this micro, bite-sized course. I'm going to learn all about self-driving cars. Um, you might think that's a bit niche. So, okay. Over about 24 hours, 20,000 students signed up for that course. So we have this expectation that students are people who come to campuses first. Maybe they spend three years, or you know, really radical idea, maybe two, maybe two years instead of three. Um, actually, maybe there's a whole other sort of student out there. Maybe it's people like these. Maybe it's courses like these. So I had my. Um, prompts for you guys earlier on, which were some of the things perhaps that you can see around AI particularly. Um, and I thought I'd come back to those just to maybe stimulate a little bit of a Q&A discussion. But I am conscious that we might struggle to hear you, so if you, if you wanted to um, ask me a question or make a comment, put your hand up, and what I'll do is I'll say back what I think you said. But if you could tell me where you're from, that would be great. So tell me your name and where you're from. And has anybody got any comments, any questions? So Sonia from uh, Knowledge Exchange has a very, very valid question. Will robots pay their taxes? And I think, is that something, was it Bill Gates commented on the other day? And it's a very interesting question, of course, because big tech firms are often accused of avoiding tax entirely through complex financial arrangements. Robots don't uh, get a pension. You don't pay national insurance for robots. Do robots consume resources in the same way that humans do? Well, no, they don't, do they? But they do consume resources in other ways. And they put people out of work. Where's the, where's the paper? It's a very interesting question. Any more? Go for it. Absolutely. So, a uh, lady from uh, Swinburne University of Technology, how might we use AI to deliver education to students? I think the really fascinating question here is actually when you have a curriculum um, of one, 
So right now we tend to think there is a curriculum. Everybody will study this and study it in roughly the same way. Some people will dig into it a little bit more than others. You know, somebody will go off and read all the books and read this. But um, when we start to put these kind of predictive analytics into the process, then we can say, well, look, you know what? Actually, you need, a, like I said earlier on, you need a bit of help with this bit. You need a little bit of help with that. And over time, perhaps what you study ends up being unique to you. And I think that creates real challenges for us in terms of assessment, uh, in terms of um, understanding, if you like, why someone uh, achieved the outcome that they did. So let's say, let's say it looks like you're going to drop out. The AI says it looks like you're going to drop out. Why is that? Well, all the AI can probably say is you look like these other people who dropped out. It doesn't necessarily know why. It's a bit like a cat running out in front of the car. You look like a cat running out in front of the car. Therefore, I slam the brakes on. So you might say, well, why do you think I look like I'm going to drop out? Maybe we don't know. And, you know, if the advice, let's say it's an AI careers advisor, should I go to college? And I says, no, I'm not going to Why is that? Well, people like you, on the whole, didn't really work out. We may find it difficult to probe much deeper than that. And I think that, again, like some of the other changes that we've talked about, I think it will be quite jarring for us not to be able to say, you know, I'm talking to a computer, what's the algorithm of like? Show me the flowchart, show me, show me that you made these inferences based on the following things. So we, we shall see. Any more for any more? Maybe take one more. Go for it. Uh, Dave Hunt from Harvard College. Um, just wondering whether um, people with a reaction to AI, etc. We'll start looking for more real experiences, uh, perhaps you know, adopt more craft skills, that type of thing. Uh, that would be an interesting sort of counter to the lives of So, uh, absolutely. So, the question was will we start to see a rise in, in demand for real, authentic experiences? And actually, I think you could. We look at that perhaps in the context of AI, um, of VR particularly. So there we are, potentially sat in our living room, we've got the VR goggles on, we could be anywhere, we could be doing anything. A lot of the apps right now are things like roller coasters. We are on a roller coaster. Actually, it's a roller coaster on the moon, I didn't tell you that. You think, wow, this is great. Meanwhile, you've sat on your sofa for two hours, and it's a lovely sunny day outside. And by the way, it is a lovely sunny day outside, so do, do go and have a look around. Um, but then you, maybe it's a bit like screen time right now. Maybe um, a, an individualized, personalized experience. And AI in games, of course, is already very well established to do this. Um, that individualized, personalized experience is so engaging, you'll really have to struggle to break out of it. And then it will be a bit like eating healthily. So getting more exercise, I mean, they've really got to, you know, cut down on the end. <laughs> but I think the, um, the, ultimately, when we talk about AI and education, I would come back to the human element. I did say I wanted to end on that week now. So that human element, the simple fact that we can use that pattern recognition, we can use that detection to say, this looks like somebody who needs a bit of help. Okay, so you could send Pepper around. Pepper could glide up to that person and say, Hello, and that's cute up to a point, but there's only so much that Pepper can actually do. Pepper is still heavily scripted. It doesn't really help anything like as much as a live human being saying, Come on, let's sit down, let's have a chat, a bit of coffee, and you can tell me what the problem is. So that's my closing note for you. If you found it interesting, oh yeah, there was one other thing. <laughs> Does anybody, has anybody seen these robots? So these are robot security guards. Um, they're currently guarding the campuses of many tech companies in Silicon Valley, and in a few shopping malls. So you know, you would think, okay, robots, and it's kind of sort of you know, not as cute as that, but it's not too intimidating. But robots plus small children who are inclined to run around a lot, and maybe we can get them to get their bitch to 
could be that the rest people is asking. So uh, here's, here's a counter example. You know, we let the robots into our lives. Maybe we get a few little surprises along the way. Well, that's been me. So I hope you found that interesting. I'm around all day. Go and come find me and talk about this if it interests you and you'd like to have a chat. Otherwise, thank you very much for coming. Enjoy the rest of the G first. So, yeah, I think one thing that's supposed to be